We open a new week with a leadership question, Pastor John. Uh, Does 1 Timothy 2.12 leave open the possibility that women are permitted to preach in the weekly gathering of a local church as an extension of the male elders of the church or as an expression under their governing authority? For example, is the wife of a pastor free to preach on Sunday morning? What would you say, Pastor John? Well, I don't want to assume that any of our listeners have all the biblical foundations in place for doing this kind of refined uh, application thinking. So let me let me put a few things in place, and then I'll specifically answer the question. Here's the text that we're talking about, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So let me work backward in that text toward my answer to the question. And and I would remind uh, the listeners that every every one of these comments raises more questions. <laughs> So there is a book, a little, little book called 50 Crucial Questions About Manhood and Womanhood that Wayne Gudeman and I did, and it's free online at Desire and God PDF. And uh, if you have more questions, I hope they're answered there. At least some of them will be, I hope. So Paul gives two reasons, uh, and they're not the only ones, for why he would limit uh, the teaching and governing office of the church to spiritually qualified men. Reason number one, verse 13, Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is shorthand for about eight to ten pointers in Genesis 1 to 3 that God intended the man to bear a unique responsibility, not sole responsibility, but unique and special responsibility for leadership in relation to women. That man was created first is one of those eight to ten pointers, and in a sense symbolizes all the others. You are there first, you bear first responsibility to lead, protect, especially when it comes to attacks from outside, which was just about to happen in chapter 3 as Satan approaches the couple who will take up responsibility to be the protector and the spokesman here and give leadership in the face of this kind of opposition. So that's number one. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Second argument he gives is um, based on that order being ignored, namely when Satan comes and it appears that both Adam and Eve are present. That's pretty plain uh, in the text in chapter 3, verse 6 of Genesis. Adam and Eve ignored that order, and Paul says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. What does that mean? There's a sense in which Adam was deceived. He did eat. In fact, when Paul treats the fall of man in Romans 5, he lays the guilt entirely on Adam, never even mentioning Eve as the guilty party here. So my understanding is not that Paul is drawing attention to a woman's greater gullibility, although in reality... I would say men are more gullible in some things and women are more gullible in some things. Lots of studies have been done on the kinds of advertising that draw men in and the kind that draw women in, and we are all differently gullible. And so I don't want to be naive and say we're exactly the same in our gullibility, but I'm not sure that's the focus of Paul here. The the main point is the reason she was deceived is that the deceiver lured her and Adam to switch places that God had appointed. It's as if the general and the colonel, the man and the woman, the general and the colonel rode up to the enemy together, and the enemy utterly ignored the general, spoke directly to the colonel, and they both, the general and the colonel, let it happen. So Genesis 3, 6 says that the man was with Eve 
while the enemy was talking to her. Quote, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So Satan's first assault was on the order that God had appointed, and both Adam and Eve at that moment were duped. They let it happen. And when Paul says Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, he's saying Satan undermined the order of creation and focused his deceptive words on Eve and made her the spokesman, not Adam. And she became the focus of the deception, not Adam. Adam failed in his leadership, and she was willing to take it up. And the result was the fall and all of its consequences. So from those two arguments in this text, Paul draws the conclusion in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. In other words, there's an order of how men and women are to relate to each other. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And those two words, teach and have authority, are the very two differences between a deacon and an elder in the local church, as Paul describes them in the list of responsibilities in chapter 3. Elders are to govern well, and they are to be apt to teach. The deacons aren't supposed to be either of those, and therefore, I take verse 12 to mean I don't permit a woman to assume the role of an elder in the church, to act the role of an elder. Whether you call them elders doesn't matter. It's the acting of the role of the elder in the church, since they are the ones charged with the responsibility of authoritative teaching. And of course, not all, not all teaching is inappropriate for women. She, Titus 2.3, she is to teach the younger women, for example. But the kind of teaching uh, that belongs to the eldership, namely the teaching that carries authority over men, is what Paul thinks would compromise God's order. And that's the issue, not competency. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking, oh, a, a woman is not permitted to to do this kind of authoritative teaching because she's incompetent. That's not the issue. The issue is that it would compromise the way men and women are supposed to relate to each other. So my answer to the question is, okay, all that to put in place. The question, here's the, here, here's the question. Let me remind the, the listener. Does 1 Timothy 2.12 leave open the possibility that women are permitted to preach in the weekly gathering of the local church as an extension or under the governing authority of the male elders of the church? And my answer is no. Neither of those qualifications, that is, an extension of or under the governing authority of, overrides the teaching of verse 12. Paul would say a female is not a proper extension of male leadership. That doesn't make sense. That's a contradiction of male leadership, not an extension of male leadership. And a woman teaching men with authority week in, week out, or every other week, or regularly in an adult Sunday school class or whatever, a woman teaching men with authority uh, under the elders is not under the authority of the New Testament. She may be under the authority of the elders, but she's not under the authority of the New Testament, and neither would they be for putting her in that situation. So, I would, I would conclude, no, that is inappropriate for churches to do that. God loves his church. He loves men and women. He loves to see all of us flourish in the use of our gifts. No man or woman should sit on the sidelines of Christian ministry. Let that be plain. No woman, no man sits on the sidelines in Christian ministry. The question is not whether all men and women should be active in ministry. They should. The only question is how. Amen. Women must be ministers. Uh, In fact, the world needs women ministers. That was the title of episode number 388 in this podcast series. And as Pastor John mentioned earlier, you can download the book, 50 Crucial Questions About Manhood and Womanhood, right now at DesiringGod.org. Click on the Books tab at the top of the screen and look for the title, which begins with the number 50, 50, and that, I think, makes it the first title on the page. Tomorrow, I ask Pastor John a preaching question about whether or not his theology of Christian hedonism drives his exegesis of Scripture. 
Until then, I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening to the Ask Pastor John podcast.